title of my talk, what's a front end dev doing writing Go and why is the FBI here? Is anybody here from the FBI? Got one hand in the front. Former FBI agent, okay. Uh, the alternative title for this talk was imposter syndrome or the FBI showing up at your doorstep. Um, somewhat related stuff. One's probably worse than the other. All right. So in 2016, an article was published online. It was detailing the plight of residents of a particular farm in Kansas in the United States. Now, over the years, these people have been falsely accused of many crimes like theft and fraud, and from time to time, law enforcement would show up. Uh, they would be visited by FBI agents asking strange questions. Uh, ambulance would show up looking for uh, suicidal veterans. Uh, police officers would show up looking for missing children. Now, it got to the point where the local sheriff had to put up a sign telling people to stay away and to call their office if they had any questions. This didn't stop the harassment. Uh, the residents were getting doxxed by internet vigilantes. Uh, private citizens would show up on their property, going through their barn, walking along like, the farms, inspecting their animals. And for some mysterious reason, a toilet randomly appeared at the foot of their driveway. Now, it turns out that this was an isolated incident. Uh, there were reports of multiple individuals across the United States, uh, even across the world, where they would experience this sort of same kind of mysterious and strange harassment. Um, what was interesting is that when they moved away from that or moved out of their home, the harassment stopped. But when the next residents moved in, they got harassed. Uh, I think the toilet only thing, the toilet thing only happened once. So it was like these homes were cursed. But it wasn't any sort of haunted spirits or any poltergeist. It was worse. It was IP addresses. It was thousands of them. Um, how many of you are familiar with IP geolocation? Oh, shoot. I'd say about 15, 20% of you guys. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with IP geolocation, this might look familiar. Um, it's called geoblocking. Uh, it's, it's one of the many applications of I IP geolocation. Now, in a nutshell, IP geolocation is a way of connecting a public IP address to a real world geographical location. So I work for MaxMind uh, as a provider of IP geolocation data. Um, and we, like you, you give us an IP address and we give you a bunch of data about that IP. Uh, we can give you the country, we can give you the province or the state. Uh, we can even get down to the zip code or out here is the postal code. As you can imagine, geolocation isn't perfect. There are many, many IP ranges where we don't have detailed information about the geographic location. Uh, for instance, we might not know what city or state an IP is in, but for most, if not all IP addresses, MaxMind is able to tell you what country it's in. So one location data point that we always provide is latitude and longitude. Now, given that latitude and longitude is a specific point on a map, or more appropriately, a, sp a specific spot in the world, let me ask you, what do you think is a reasonable place uh, or a reasonable latitude and longitude to uh, place uh, a city, a province, or a country? Okay, how about for the United States? Where would you put the latitude and longitude? He doesn't know, neither did we. But we just eventually landed at the center of the United States, the geographic center of it. It seems reasonable, right? I mean, not the edges, just plop right in the middle. Well, it turns out this Kansas farm is in the geographic center of the United <laughs> States. Now, MaxMind was made aware of this Kansas farm issue as well as like, all the other homes across the world. 
just, just before the 2016 article was published. Um, now, as you can imagine, it didn't occur to MaxMind that data would be misused this way or you know, locating people down to a household or a business or what have you. Um, and nor did we intend for IP geolocation or at least our data to be used to track someone down. Um, at best, we're pretty confident, at least in the United States, we're pretty confident that uh, we're able to narrow it down to a postal code or a zip code, which is good enough for most services, as you can imagine, especially advertising and such. Um, now, this is like the cover our butt section of the, of the talk. If you go through the GIP, or the project's called GIP, if you go through the documentation, along with the latitude and longitude, we give you this thing called an accuracy radius, as you can see by the circle, circle here. Uh, we include a note that given this accuracy radius, radius uh, we have like a 67% confidence level that the IP or the device that has that IP is in that circle. And, and like regardless, MaxMind isn't the only geolocation company out there. There's plenty of them that provides latitude and longitude data. So it's kind of hard to say if it was our data that was misused or I don't know, a user just ignored the accuracy radius, stuff like that. Well, in any case, we, we took this, the, the issue very, very seriously and immediately started working on fixing the data to prevent you know, any more harm. As you can imagine, it was all hands on deck. I was on the team that was responsible for creating the, the, the web interface for, uh, some of our, for some of our employees to review each location. Uh, this is the web app itself. You can see a Google map on the right, notes, all, you know, all that cool stuff. Um, and really the way it works is we would put a pin on the map, as you can see by that red pin, and you would drag the green pin that's right beside it to like a safe location. In this case, it was the body of water. Um, right, so as I was working on this web app, I was reading through the documentation as a good developer does. Uh, I was going on Stack Overflow, all that good stuff. And I came across the Google Maps static image API. Essentially, you give it the latitude and longitude, and I'll give you an image. Uh, uh, I think it's a ping image. Now, this is the esoteric part of the Google Maps API. Along with that, you can style the map. You can assign colors to different features like roads, parks, um, you know, make a park purple, uh, make a road green, uh, make the water blood red. Um, now, when I was looking at this, a light bulb went off in my head. What if we could style the map so that only water appears? Was, was this be possible? Hell yeah, you could. This is a map uh, of a beach in Toronto where I'm from, and the only thing here is blue for water, everything else is transparent. So it should be pretty easy, right? So if I gave you an image of just blue and nothing, you should be able to find the, that blue. You need a little bit of computer vision, some machine learning, you know what I mean? Like really expensive GPUs, uh, get really good at Python, I, or you could use an Archimedean spiral. Really strange stuff, right? Now check this out. If you overlay the spiral on the center of the map, because that's the location that you requested, and you started traversing the spiral, going around and around and around, eventually you'll hit a body of water. Um, and it, as it turns out, that becomes like the closest body of water to the location that you requested and you have a safe location. There's a little Mario star for you to, to note that. The thing is, is that you have a point on a static image. You don't necessarily have latitude and longitude. So now you gotta do a little bit of math. You gotta read more documentation. Um, so there's, there's three key things here you need to know about. Pixel coordinates, world coordinates, and latitude and longitude. So, pixel coordinates. It's a, defined as a location on a map at a sp specific zoom level. 
we know the pixel coordinates of the original location because you can you, you can translate latitude to pixel coordinates, but you don't know the the, the latitude and longitude of the, the safe location. But really, it's just pixel counting. Go up, like you know, ten pixels up, ten pixels to the left, and now you have the pixel coordinates of this safe location. The next step is you need to convert the pixel coordinates to a world map coordinate. Um, here is a map, a Mercator projection standard map that you've, we've all seen. And what you do is you start at the top left and call that origin 0, 0. And as you go to the x, you start incrementing that value, y, increment that value, and it's a fixed value or a fixed max at 255. Um, it's a floating point number, so there you have decimals to work with. Um, I think, oh, it's a 255 or 256. So there's this direct relationship to that flat map to a zoomed-in uh, view of a, of a location. Uh, the way that map, map works is uh, you take a point on the world map, as you zoom in, like when you use Google Maps, you zoom in, and these are fixed zoom levels, um, you, you multiply the value by like two to the power of the zoom level. Um, so just to recap, you have your pixel coordinate, you need to get the world coordinate, so you divide the pixel coordinate by two to the power of the zoom level. Straight arithmetic, even a front end dev can do it. Now the last step is to convert the world coordinate to latitude and longitude. This is like 16th century map, it's really, really complicated and I'm actually quite tired of thinking about it. Um, you can go on Wikipedia page, you can, you can see all the formulas, you can see the controversial history of, of Mercator projections. Um, you can, in the animated image, like, that's trying to show you like, what the actual size of a country is versus how it's projected on a map. Right, so, I'm a front-end dev. JavaScript is my mother tongue. So I decided to write a proof of concept in the browser. Um, there was a really handy Canvas API called get image data. You give it like a bounding box and it gives you all the RGB values for that particular set of, of, of pixels. And like really, it, it was actually mind blowing that you could actually do this in the browser. The next step, of course, was to write it in Node. Um, and I had to give shout outs to some, uh, some open software, uh, open source software de uh, developers out there. This is um, Harrison Hogg on the left. He wrote a node library that generated spirals, including the Archimedean spiral. Automatic of WordPress fame. I, I think I actually heard people say great things about WordPress outside during the smoke break. But they also wrote a Canvas implementation for node. Um, and last but not least, you have Zach Barden. He created the Mercator projection library that helped me convert values uh, to and fro from pixel coordinates to latitude and longitude. Um, right, so I did a node. It was slow as hell. And it used a, a, a ton of resources. Excluding the network request, it took anywhere between five to 10 seconds to analyze a location and to find that safe location. And mind you, we have about hundreds of thousands of locations to review and only so much CPU power and hard drive space to uh, store all the node modules. Um, and plus I knew like the last thing our SRE team wanted to do was, was set up a node environment for my own, my own little dinky node program. So, enter go. Now at this point, MaxMind, we started writing a lot of our daemons and services in Go. On top of that, Hacker News was just filled with articles about Go and how it's gonna save the world, uh, or at least you know, keep your project manager off your back. So my mind was primed to give this language a shot. Thing is that coming from a dynamic language like JavaScript, Go seemed like deceptively cumbersome. Now I say deceptively because the language seems so simple and compact. I, I think that's why a lot of people from Java and, and C Sharp, they, that's one of the first things they notice. Um, and yeah, they always felt so bloated and abstract, whereas Go really just got to the point. 
But at the same time, I spent so much time debugging my code. Um, sometimes I didn't know what kind of integer to use. Uh, sometimes I forgot to put a colon in front of the equal sign or when I was assigning a variable. Or sometimes I put a colon in front of the uh, equal sign when I was updating the value. Um, I spent a long time trying to figure out where the hell classes were in Go. Um, I had no idea what a slice was. And yeah, sometimes I didn't use a pointer when I should have, or I didn't dereference the pointer. Uh, but really, I haven't had to deal with pointers in, in any practical way in my career, so I, um, I didn't see the point. And on top of that, if error does not equal nil, I had to write this so many damn times. Like it, 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 I felt like 25% of my code was this. It just seemed like gophers love to maybe return errors. So after the initial struggle that comes with learning a new language, things started to click. Slices were just like JS arrays, and Go arrays are pretty much JS arrays with a defined size. Uh, structs and new functions replace classes and constructors. Um, explicit, handling, explicit error handling is a good thing that ensures consistency, and concise variable declaration is a joy to type. And pointers are really cool. So to my surprise, the Go code and the JavaScript code looked really similar. Um, and this is just some trivial stuff here. It's a bunch of arithmetic. Uh, but it is actually real code pulled out of, out of, the, uh, of the code base. Um, I'm not going to keep it up too long so that you guys don't bash me or submit issue requests and all that. Now, eventually, I ported everything over to Go, and it felt good. I learned a new language. Uh, I, knew, I learned a few new paradigms. But all this work would be for naught if the Go program wasn't any faster than the Node program. Did I succeed? Well, I still have a job, so I did. It took five milliseconds to analyze one location versus five to 10 seconds for Node. Now, in the end, the SR team was overjoyed that they didn't have to set up a dedicated Node environment for my little program. Uh, the backend team, they were relieved that they didn't have to review any more JavaScript code and do security checks on Node modules, because there was like thousands of them. And what was nice was that the front end team actually got to see like Go code being written out. Especially they got to see the, actually the translation from Node to Go, and they were able to see that connection. Uh, of course, the most important thing is that this Go program helped stop more toilets from being dis disposed of on innocent people's property. Uh, this section is called Potpourri. I don't know if you guys watch Jeopardy. It's, this is just like a mixed bag of things that I came across when I was working on this program. Right, more law enforcement. So if you wanted to get the latitude and longitude for any country in the world, you can get that value from the CIA World Factbook. Actually, that's where we got the, the latitude and longitude for, uh, for the center of the United States. To this day, the CIA World Factbook still points to the Kansas form. Um, so this is a, a Google map image of, of somewhere in Beijing. What was interesting about China is that they have a different coordinate system. Um, this becomes apparent when you use satellite view on Google Maps. The overlaid streets and buildings that you see here, like uh, the yellow line there, uh, that's, that's the Chinese coordinate system for that bridge, or that's a, they use the Chinese coordinates for, for that map view. And then satellite view, it uses, um, it uses the standard coordinate system that we're all familiar with out here. And right, last but not least, uh, earlier I shouted out the, the node module packages I used for this prototype. Uh, you may have noticed that I didn't give any love to any Go libraries that I use in the program. And, and that's because I didn't use any. I only used Go's standard library and ported over the useful bits from the, the, from the node libraries, like the spiral and such. 
over to Go. And that's my talk. Thanks, everyone.